welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packwell, and welcome to Scripture and Tradition, where we take a look at sacred scripture through the lens of apostolic tradition. And of course, we love to have you be part of the show. You can have add your questions or comments during the live program by calling us. If you are in North America, you can call 1-800-221-9419. one 800 221 Nine four six zero. If you are not in North America, that won't work. So you can call country code 1, area code 205, 271-2980. You can also send us your questions or comments via email by writing to Scripture and Tradition at EWTN.com or through our social media pages like Facebook and YouTube. Now, of course, if you've missed a show, you can go back to EWTN's YouTube page and watch it whenever you want. All you have to do is go to youtube.com slash EWTN and find all these older programs. Now, in the past few shows, we've been taking a look at what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. And today, we're going to talk about various ideas of good and evil that affect people's perception of God. And it affects the way that they want to do His will or don't. So in my book, How to Listen When God is Speaking, a guide for modern-day Catholics, we are on page 22, if you're following along with us. And uh, you can, of course, get this book from EWTNRC.com. It is item number 1833, and use it as a study guide or just listen along without it, either way. All right, so we've been talking about the um, meaning of good and evil, and I'd like to summarize a little bit. First of all, one of the points I've been making about evil is that it is not the same as the physical world. Um, it's not a material reality in contrast to a spiritual reality that is good. That was the thought of Gnostics and such people. That's not Christian teaching. Nor do we see that good and evil is some sort of balance between two forces. This kind of teaching showed up in Taoism. Taoism, uh, the Tao means the way, and it was the mainly proposed by a Chinese philosopher named Lao Tzu. He lived from 604 to 531 BC, right around the time that the Israelites went into the Babylonian exile. He was just a young teenager when that happened. Um, and at any rate, um, uh, Taoism uh, has this idea that there are two forces, yin and yang, and that they are seeking balance. The yin-yang symbol seeks balance. And uh, the idea is that opposites are necessary to each other. And if you notice, there's a yin-yang symbol on the screen that it's the, the dark and the light flowing toward each other like swirls or waves. And then in the middle, there's a dark spot in the uh, white and a white spot in the uh, dark, in the black. And the idea is that there's also the opposite contained in each thing. This is part of the meaning of that symbol. And 
the idea is that you seek harmony between light and darkness, between male and female, um, and good and evil. Okay, now, something that you have to keep in mind. Lao Tzu had a very high moral ideal. The difficulty is the way some modern people try to interpret Lao Tzu, interpret uh, Taoism, as trying to keep a balance between moral good and moral evil as two complementary and necessary forces. That if you have police, you have to have criminals. If you have criminals, you have to have police. And it's just in a balance. And, you know, that's not what Lao Tzu was trying to say, but a lot of modern people have that. For instance, um, when I was studying the New Age movement back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, I came across uh, one lady who, uh, her writings, anyway, I didn't meet her, but I met, read her writings, where she said, well, I used to be a nun back in England, and uh, I was killed by the Inquisition, burned at the stake. And then later on, I became um, a, a uh, loose woman, shall we say, hanging around a Wild West saloon in the United States in the 1880s. Uh, I can imagine she worked for Miss Kitty or something on Gunsmoke. At any rate, uh, she said, and then I got burned there too, so I still have a fear of fire. Uh, <laughs> and, and some of these folks would even say, well, I used to be a monk or a nun. I think I need to try a life of moral license uh, right now. And so and instead of being a good nun, I'll be good at being sinful. That's not what Lao Tzu meant, and that's not Christian morality by any stretch of the imagination. And by the way, about that lady who said she was a, a nun in England killed by the Inquisition, she had a little problem there. England never had the Inquisition. Just saying. All right, so that's one form of understanding good and evil that is not Christian. Another way of understanding uh, morality that we talked about last week is that morality is merely a social construct and we can make it change anytime we want. This is very popular right now. And this, so evil uh, is not material reality versus spiritual. Evil does not refer to balancing good and evil, uh, all of Star Wars perhaps, with the dark side and the white light side of the uh, force, or a social construct that you people just make up to keep social control. That's not what we believe, none of those. And they're around a lot. These ideas flow through the, the, the culture. Christians and Jews agree on this, that God made all of creation good. In fact, um, yesterday's and today's readings from Genesis chapter 1, the first reading at Mass yesterday and today, these are making that same proclamation that the physical world is good. Each creature is good. Being physical is not bad. It's a good thing. But evil is when you take something that is good and deprive it of its goodness. And you deprive it of goodness by misusing or abusing the thing. So um, this is a very, very important point that uh, what we do is try to use the good creatures for the purposes of the good they were created to accomplish. And again, right now, 
we have a lot of people say, well, there's no purpose to things. Things don't have a purpose. They just are there. That's not unusual. But, frankly, everybody recognizes certain things are evil, especially when they're done to them. Even a moral relativist, if you were to catch them in a dark alley and hold a gun to them, they would probably try to plead with you, saying, don't shoot me, I didn't do anything to deserve this. And they'd be right. Nobody deserves to be murdered in a dark alley or anywhere else. But they would, but notice how they assume I don't deserve this. They really do believe in good and evil. Uh, when it comes down to evil affecting them, they're strong believers in that evil. And what we have to do is realize that evil comes from misusing good creatures. And uh, when you misuse something that is good, uh, it shows that it's off kilter. Um, I like to use the example of an egg. If you don't let the egg hatch, or if you don't cook it, the egg will rot and smell bad. That's the reality. And that is true, not only for physical nature, but it's also true in human nature. God has purposes for us. He has goals for what it means to be human. And the ultimate goal that God has for humans is that we would spend eternal life with him in heaven. That is God's number one goal for us. And he wants us to be that image of God that reflects his goodness and reflects it perfectly back to him. Not that we'll ever be infinite. We can't be infinite. We're, we're limited. That's fine. But we want to be images of the infinite God who reflect back to him the uh, goodness that he has and th that he is, in fact. And this is something that we do not only in terms of moral goodness, but also in terms of beauty and truth. All of these are ways in which we you know, reflect God back to him. Now, that means that one of the starting points of a spiritual life is to live morally. Having a good moral life, obeying God's commandments, is a start to the spiritual life. It's not the only goal, but it is a necessary condition that you want to obey God's commandments and make his values your own values and my own values. This is our, what we are supposed to do. And that sets the stage that makes it possible for us to have this relationship with God on an open way and good way. Now, obeying God's law is a first, just necessary starting point in listening to God. But we also all probably are well aware that obeying God's law is easier to want to do than it is to do. We can want to be good. St. Paul talked about that in Romans 8 when he said, I know what God's law is and I want to do God's law. But there's another law in my flesh that fights against God's law. So I do that which I don't want to do. I commit the sins 
I don't want to commit. And this is a reality that he identifies as the flesh. St. Augustine used another term, a Latin word, uh, concupiscence. Concupiscence refers to that effect of original sin by which we want what is good, but in a disordered way. Okay? Now, there's a couple ways in which that happens. Um, you know, we have to, first of all, recognize what is good and bad, but then we can also see the disorder. Uh, most of us, and myself included, would like a lot more dessert than vegetables. You know, I, if given a choice between, you know, a nice dessert and some uh, Brussels sprouts, I'm going to go for the dessert. Sometimes it helped to get me to eat Brussels sprouts if my mom said, you don't get dessert unless you eat them, then I would go ahead and do that. But we would oftentimes forego exercise, forego green and yellow vegetables, and overindulge in cream pies and other desserts. Um, and that will harm your health. You can't eat too much, eat too much of the wrong things, smoke and overindulge in drinking, all that stuff, without it having a bad effect on your health. That's key. So part of what's going on with make something that is evil is that dessert is good. There's nothing wrong with dessert. Matter of fact, a little something sweet helps close off the palate. But if you want it too much, or if you want it with the wrong timing, I'll eat my, I'll eat my vegetables if you give me dessert first. So that probably wouldn't happen. But, you know, you oftentimes we would like to have dessert first. There's even, you know, little T-shirts and baseball caps saying, Eat the life is short. Eat dessert first. <clears throat> this is something that um, we would load up on empty calories that don't really give us nourishment and that would cause us harm. And there's also a, another kind of disordered use of timing. If you've been overeating and smoking and other things, drinking too much, and you're overweight, and then you try to exercise too much, you can even then bring on the heart attack that you were trying to avoid by exercise. Part of keeping a balance of good and evil in our lives is knowing the timing of when we should do a good thing and avoid other good things, and also the amounts, how much we should do with something, how little we should do with it, keeping those kinds of balances in mind is part of what determines whether something is good. And this is something, these are images for the moral behavior. What we're going to do, we're going to take a little break, we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about you know, what makes something moral and what doesn't. So let's take, take a break and we'll come back in just a couple minutes.
All right. Um, first of all, I want to make something clear before I go on. You know, I've been talking about good timing and balance in terms of food as an analogy for understanding good and evil. Okay? It's an analogy. And, and that's very useful. I am not saying that the goal of morality is to be moderate. Now, again, in food, moderation is a good thing. So we don't overeat. We don't eat too much of the unhealthy foods or things that are not quite healthy enough. No, you have to have moderation in that. But moral questions are beyond mere moderation. You know, it's um, uh, something you have to take a look at. Serious moral issues are beyond moderation, and they come more from warping or distorting human relationships with God and with one another. That's where the moral evil is. So you can understand a little bit of the imagery of eating too much of the wrong foods and things, but the, uh, the most important element of morality has to do with our relationships with God and with other people. That's key. So um, it's a very uh, good thing. It's a, it's a great thing to maintain <clears throat> your own dignity. Protecting your, your dignity as a human being is a positive good and that all of us should respect not only our own human dignity, but that of other people. But it becomes an evil if in order to protect your dignity, you have to attack other people. And you want to make yourself look good by making other people look bad. I think I may have mentioned this experience when my father was in the hospital with his last illness. I was in the waiting room when he was in surgery, and all these people were watching the Jerry Springer show. And I thought, why are they watching this? This is not that interesting. But it came to my mind that as I was more observing the people who were watching the show than I was interested in the program, I began to wonder whether or not they were watching this show to be able to say to themselves, well, I know I'm kind of bad, but I'm not that bad. I think that that was part of the attraction of that program, my hunch. And a lot of people, uh, do that in the media. I, I, there was just an article in um, an editorial page of how uh, a lady was complaining that the various people in the news media attack people they disagree with. And instead of just reporting various data, they talk about how they feel bad about this, they don't like this, they disagree with it, they give all their opinions and feelings and sharings and all that stuff. Um, and they start to sound like they're trying to be on the cast of the Jerry Springer show. Just watch some of the news shows, see what I mean. And, you know, this is not the way you make your own self look good by putting down other people. It's in fact, that's a sin. Even if what you say is provably true, you have to make sure that it is worth knowing why, you know, I should talk about this sin in somebody else's life. Um, you know, what, why would I be talking about these things? in other people's experience. Um, make me feel good? 
No, 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 no. This is not good. And it may, again, it may be true, but if it's not for good purpose, for instance, knowing that somebody is doing bad things and I have to protect other people from their bad intentions, maybe I have to reveal something in that kind of situation. But, uh, for instance, if I yell, hey, there's a guy walking down the street with a gun and he's pointing it all over the place. Get out of the way. That should, that's known. That should be known. But if it's something that is just, you know, gossip about them, you know, I'm asking for trouble for myself, spiritually, if I talk about that. So this is something that we have to pay attention to in terms of morality. Also, we need very much to pay attention to how God is speaking to us in his commandments. He addresses a wide variety of moral uh, issues. You know, we have to deal with adultery, stealing, honoring our parents, killing, telling the truth, honoring God, not taking his name in vain, keeping the Sabbath holy. All of these are his commandments. In fact, the first three commandments are about how we live with God. You only believe in the one God. You only honor and worship the one God. You don't worship any other gods. You don't compromise on that. You don't take his name in vain. And you, you do keep the Sabbath. These are the key sacraments, or the key commandments for uh, showing proper love of God with our whole heart, mind, and soul. The other seven commandments focus on how we live harmoniously with other people. You don't steal their stuff. You don't try to kill them, and you don't kill them. You show honor to the proper people, like your parents and others, and you tell the truth. The, and you don't even covet their stuff. This is very necessary for living harmoniously with other people. And obeying these commandments and their ramifications, because each commandment has different ramifications. For instance, it says thou shalt not steal, but we include in that taking bribes or giving bribes. That's a form of stealing. And this is something that uh, we, don't, we don't do. We look at these ramifications of the commandments and try to live them out so that we each have personal integrity. That is the goal of obeying the commandments, to have personal integrity. The ability to live with God in peace and to live with each other in peace and in integrity and acceptance. This is very important. And we have to make a decision. Will I let the commandments of God guide my life? Will I let the commandments of God set the limits in my life? And this is very, very challenging today because our, our culture has become very focused on individualism. I do it my way. Frank Sinatra made that a song, I did it my way. And we also have a relativistic society. Well, you have this kind of truth here, that kind of truth over there, you know, and we all just can agree to disagree. This is a challenge to obeying God's commandments. God doesn't say, well, if it suits you, I, I would like it that if you didn't steal other people's stuff or destroy their property. No, no, no. This, uh, our, our culture tries to put our autonomy as a higher good than obeying God's commandments. I have to be true to myself. What does that even mean to you? I don't know. Being true to yourself as a Christian or a Jew is going to be being obedient to God's commandments and 
entering into the depths of the meaning of his values and his law. Now, again, we have a tendency as human beings to become disordered. If we let go, we stop making the effort, we easily become disordered. And relativism seems natural in that kind of world. And we see that going on today where people are just going off with <coughs> destroying people's property. That's part of what we do. We see right now as police are being put on the back burner in a lot of our cities, what happens? There's an increase of crime. There's more violence. People are getting killed more often, robbed more often. Carjackings and kidnappings are up on the rise. And we can add to that family breakdown and poverty that comes with it and the heartbreak that goes with it. This is something that God addresses by saying you don't commit adultery. You don't go outside of family. You have your children within family. And what we don't want is to live out the bitter fruit of disobedience or the rotten fruit of neglect of God's commandments. Our society will get worse and worse if we neglect God in his commandments. There's no way around that. And obeying God's commandments are going to be a way of making us better human beings, able to live together better. It's no accident that George Washington and some of the other founders of our country said after the Constitution was written down, they said that this Constitution will only work if you have a moral people. If people don't have interior morality, this Constitution will not help to keep the society together. It works as a balance when people are ethical and moral. And they recommended that we teach God's commandments and live God's commandments. And in that way, we'll be able to have a better society. And we will also be able to listen to God in our own lives. All right. Well, that concludes this chapter on our first principles. Next week, we'll start to take a look at some other aspects of, um, you know, the, uh, the book on listening and uh, some of the other basic principles that we have. Um, that'll be a good thing. All right. Let's go now to some questions. We have Katrina on the phone. Katrina, where are you calling from? Buffalo, New York. From Buffalo, great. And what is your question? Well, I have a question. Um, in the past, I had committed several mortal sins, mm -hmm. but now I'm living a different kind of life. Mm -hmm. I'm, I read all spiritual books. I try to go to Mass as often as I can. Mm -hmm. um, I go for adoration, and I go to confession, when, you know, even for venial sins, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the, the more I confess them, the, the more sure. it's easier not to commit them again. And, I find the same. I, and pardon me, something? I said I find the same principle working in my life, too. You're right. Yes, I mean, some, I know that you don't have to uh, confess being a sin, but I find it very helpful. And um, I'm just, I'm just different now. And, and, and I'm, I'm wondering sometimes, I, I didn't even want to waste your time with this question, because I don't think i looked at your past. He looks at the type of person you are now. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, I would say that's right. You know, here's, here's one of the goals, Katrina, that, you know, of course, God forgives our past sins. And it really, when he forgives us, it really is a new beginning. There's no doubt of that. And we have a new start. That's fantastic. One thing that, uh, that has uh, some effect on a lot of us is that sometimes we remember past sins in order to better integrate in our relationship with God what we did in the past so we can go forward better. And, but we have to, there's a, again, as with everything, it's good to remember our past sins. But if you do it in a way that's not healthy, it can be harmful. So I'll give an example. Some people can be scrupulous. They basically have the sense, well, I should be a better person than this, right? That's true. And I should never committed this, right? That's true. And then they keep going back over and over like, well, because I committed this, God could never forgive me. No, that's not true. That's not true. You, you don't go back and remember the past because I still don't think God can forgive me. He can forgive me. That's an act of faith that Christ and his death on the cross is more powerful, infinitely more powerful than any of my sins. But I also need to go back and understand that past. I don't want to neglect it because I can repeat the same thing. But I learned to keep a balance of being aware of my conscience, integrating my past sins, and moving forward uh, because God sees us as these new creations in Christ. And I would urge you to take a look at 2 Corinthians 5, where he talks about being a new creation in Christ. That would be a, probably a help for you to meditate and pray on. I have an email here from Barbara in New Hampshire. It says, Father Paco, I'm trying to understand teaching regarding peaceful civil disobedience in our society. How do I discern biblical guidance versus my personal leanings? I want to be prepared for when or if I am faced with such a situation. Barbara from New Hampshire. Well, Barbara, you know, first of all, there are two elements. One, that the issue that you are protesting and going to be disobedient in society about is an important moral issue. Good example is what we saw back when I was young, that there were, it was illegal for African-American people to sit at certain lunch counters and restaurants. And even if it was legal, some, for instance, up in Chicago, up in the north, it was legal for blacks to go to any restaurant they wanted. But a lot of times, they just wouldn't be served. But in some places, particularly in the deep south, it was illegal for them to sit at certain restaurants and lots of other horrible laws. Those were inherently immoral laws. And by sitting with African Americans at one of those lunch counters, you were breaking the law, but it was an inherently unjust law. And the act of sitting with, you know, or at, at the place was enough to, you know, cause a reaction from other people. But it was a, a legitimate behavior that was, that fit, you know, what you're trying to improve, and it was against an immoral situation. On the other hand, while you have a, a grave evil like abortion, but a man here in Birmingham some years ago 
bombed an abortion clinic. And he was doing civil disobedience. It was disobedient to blow up somebody else's property and do that permanent damage and injured other people. And so that was immoral because the means to protest a grave evil like abortion was an immoral means. You can't do that. So this is where you have to pay attention to the issue that you're protesting being a real evil and the means that you use is commensurate, that is, it fits the situation and itself is not evil, but itself is good. That's what you have to look for in any civil disobedience. Okay? All right, we need to take a break. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. Denise on the phone. Denise, where are you calling from? Baltimore, Maryland. Okay, and what's your question? Um, if, you, if someone had an abortion, did they have to forgive the doctor that gave the abortion to the lady? You know, you, you, you could make, in, in, in terms of your own attitude, you could extend an act of forgiveness and prayer for that doctor who did the abortion. That, that the, the person who had it could do that and, and probably should. But also, the doctor who did that will have to go uh, to uh, you know, ask God's uh, forgiveness and mercy himself or herself, uh, that they are responsible for their part in it and um, the, the person getting the abortion is responsible for their part. But it would be good to, to pray for the doctor that did that with hopes that the doctor will repent um, and forgiving them, especially, you know, and there are plenty of times where they do harm to the mother of the child as well as, of course, to the child. So forgiving them may be quite appropriate but I would especially urge that anyone who does that pray for that doctor and any nurses attending to um, repent of that grave evil and, you know, never do it again. So that would be very, very important. And we also have Maria on the line. Maria, where are you calling from? From Pennsylvania. Great. Thank you for calling. And what is your oh. question? My question is, uh, last Sunday, I was uh, watching uh, the Catholic comes home. Yes. There was a guy that uh, wasn't a Catholic, then come back a Catholic, uh -huh. but was a Catholic Byzantine, Byzantine Catholic. So what difference make between a Roman Catholic and Byzantine Catholic? Oh, well, the difference, uh, you know, is, um, A, they're both completely fully and wonderfully Catholic. Um, the difference is that the Byzantine Catholics use the liturgies composed by St. John Chrysostom and St. Basil, and we use the liturgies composed in Rome. And, you know, our default language is Latin, but we translate into other languages. Well, their default language is Greek, but they translate their liturgy into other languages. Other than that, it's just a matter of, um, you know, when you, I imagine, Maria, that you're from Italy. I think she's gone, but, uh, but you know, Italians will make their red sauce 
with certain herbs and spices, and Greeks make a red sauce with cinnamon and nutmeg called the kapama sauce. So you can have a marinara sauce, you can have a, a, a kapama sauce. In both cases, you're getting red sauce to put with your meat and your pasta. And they're both delicious, but different flavors. And that might be one way to understand it. Okay? All right. We have another email here. Uh, Father Mitch, if Christ was both fully human and fully spiritual, parentheses, divine, and is consubstantial with the Father, is there not still some human aspect in God's being? James, um, uh, your question is kind of confused, James. First of all, all human beings have a spiritual component. We are not pure matter. We are spirit and body. Okay? That's, so all of us. And Christ has you know, a, a human body, and he has a human soul. And he has a divine mind and a human mind, a divine will and a human will. So, you know, keep that clear, that being human means spiritual and bodily, spiritual and physical. But Christ is divine. So now we're talking about infinite God who was never created, he never was made, as we say in the creed, and he is consubstantial with the Father. What does that mean? He has the same divine substance or the divine reality as God the Father and the Holy Spirit. And that it is in Christ, his he has united his divine person with human nature. So he has the full divine nature, full human nature. Now, to say that there is some human aspect in God's being, that's a funny way to put the question. What would be better is that Christ has, Christ, who is God, has taken human nature. But it's only the second person. The Father doesn't have human nature, only divine nature. The Holy Spirit does not have a human nature, only a divine nature. Christ is the only person who has both human and divine natures. So to say that there is still some human aspect in God's being is a funny way to ask the question. I would focus just on the fact the Father has only divine nature, the Holy Spirit has only divine nature. The second person is both a divine nature and a full human nature. And that's the way I would put it. Okay? All right, we have another caller on the line. Nelson? Yes. Where are you calling from? California. Great, great, and welcome. And what is your question? Yeah, I just uh, had a request. If you can elaborate on the second commandment. Uh, uh -huh. We went over the first three. It was a little unclear. Yeah, okay. That's, that's basically it, yeah, just to elaborate on the second one. So what, what part of the second one is it that you're asking about? What aspect of that? Yeah, it was a little unclear. I think you mentioned, uh, you know, have no other gods, worship no other gods. Yeah. Oh, and I see. Just what it is. All right. So, Nelson, the second commandment is you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Mm -hmm. So we don't use God's name. And it, 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 I'm afraid we hear it quite a bit, mm -hmm. uh, you know, out there in our culture today. Uh, people just unthinkingly use God's name in vain. Now, this is not the same as using naughty language. No, that's not God's name. And, you know, it's just, just that your mother might want to wash your mouth out with soap. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but that's not God's name. It's taking his name. And when they say in vain, there's a specific word used there. Um, and it's uh, shave, 
in Hebrew. And to take the names of the Lord Beshava means that you use it for, uh, originally it meant to use it for some magical purpose. In other words, you try to control other things around you by God's name. Mm -hmm. Or you try to, to you know, and, and people will use God, the, you know, the word God, in trying to um, bring damnation upon other people. You can't do that. You know, this is, whether somebody is damned or saved has nothing to do with your use of God's name. And you never, ever should wish that somebody would be damned to hell. You always wish that they be redeemed. Now, you can point out they have bad behavior and you can be angry in expressing it. But, you know, you don't use God's name to wish something evil on somebody else. That is misusing God's name. Does that help? That's very much so. Thank you very much. You're absolutely welcome. All right, then I have another email here. Dear Father Mitch, you're very knowledgeable about the Holy Land sites. It is, is it true that Jesus spent some time in the dungeon at Caiaphas' residence before the crucifixion? When we visited the Holy Land, we were taken to the dungeon. As a matter of fact, I've gone there myself. However, our Protestant friends don't believe that such an event took place as it's not mentioned in the Bible. What's your opinion on this? Elizabeth from Maryland. Well, I don't know what their difficulty would be, frankly, Elizabeth. Um, he was in the house of Caiaphas. Caiaphas had two kinds of prisons. One of them, in fact, is where the apostles Peter and John were kept when they got arrested in the temple. And the other one was a higher security dungeon. Now, it doesn't mention it there, but Jesus was kept at Caiaphas' house after his trouble, uh, excuse me, after his trial by Caiaphas. And they had to wait until Pontius Pilate woke up and got to work. So they kept him someplace in the house. And I guarantee you, he was not walking around the dining room picking up little tidbits to nibble on. They kept him in a secure place because they were worried about somebody trying to come and take him away. So it makes sense. It doesn't say that they, they put him in that dungeon, but it makes very good sense that he would be there. And in fact, that is a place I like to go pray, uh, especially Psalm 88, where it says, my only friend is darkness. That's a powerful, powerful moment there. All right, but we are out of moments. So may the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And again, we depend on you keeping us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. It's the only way that we pay our bills. You've been so good and generous to us, and we appreciate it very much. So thank you for that, and we just ask as these COVID crisis continues, help to keep us on the air. God bless you, and thank you. Mm -hmm.